Father, today we think in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you have given us the ability to face another day. Yes. Father, that you have given us the courage again to stand up yes. and look beyond those things that held our hearts and fears and held us, dear God, in bondage to the elements and to the times and the things that we came out of. Father, we thank you that your spirit gives us the strength to face a new day with courage and make something of that day and not just another mess. So, Father, we just thank you now that as the word goes forward, dear God, let the hearts of the people be open. Father, let them understand and see that they do have a purpose in life and that their purpose is far greater than they have ever realized and that the object that they're here, Father, is that they may have a relationship with you and grow into a relationship with others. And, Father, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bibles today to the book of 1 John, chapter 3. 1 John, chapter 3. As you're doing so, I want to share with you very quickly, if you are not in a committed place, if you are not a part of this body in which you should be here tonight, if you are not a member of this body and are coming here tonight, I invite you to channel 23 at 6 o'clock for a service I'm going to be ministering on grace, the power of grace, and it's a material that we have never released yet in this area. If you are in this church, if you are a member of this church, this will be your responsibility to help build and strengthen what God is doing now in your church. But if you are not, I simply open this up to you so that you will know that there is something else available for you tonight if you're not a member. Amen? Amen. Responsibility, if you are a member, you're here. Amen? All right. First John chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message. They put the article the, which means the only real message. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning. It's an amazing thing how we start out hearing one thing from God, and by the time it gets down, it has been so filtered down, so changed with opinion, so altered by somebody else's idea, or their vision, or their aspiration, or their hurt, or their desperation, that it starts out a very clear, simple message and by the time it finally gets around to where everybody is, it's very complicated and nothing like the same. This is the message that started from the beginning. You mean we're not supposed to know about all of the apostolic positions? It's not going to get you to heaven. You mean I, I don't have to know about everything to do about life or creation? It's not going to get you to heaven. You mean I don't have to know about everything to do with end time prophecy? It's not going to get you to heaven. You mean I don't have to know about all the things, about all these weird, unusual words in the Bible, what they mean? It's not going to get you to heaven. You mean I don't have to know everything there is to know about church structure? It's not going to get you to heaven. You mean I don't have to know everything there is about prayer, all the types of prayers, when to pray, when not to pray, whether to stand, whether to sit, whether to hold my hands up, whether to hold my hands down, what to do with my hands at all? You mean I don't have to learn about all these things about prayer? It's not going to get you to heaven. Don't I have to learn about all the gifts? It's not going to get you to heaven. Don't I have to learn about all the things about the Holy Spirit? It's not going to get you to heaven. Don't I have to learn all about healing? It's not going to get you to heaven. There's only one thing that you absolutely, unequivocally must know, and you must know thoroughly, you must know Jesus Christ. Amen. And you must know that He loves you. Anything else is gravy. And it may well be good down the line, but who cares if you get healed if you die and go to hell? Who cares if you're rich and you die and go to hell? Who cares if you know all the gifts and you can move with all the wonderful signs and you still don't have Jesus? It really doesn't matter. The one true thing is the fact that you understand about the love of God. We have more people hurt, frustrated, angry today because they feel that God doesn't love them. They have heard some message about moving in some gifts or moving in some power and something didn't work. They didn't get their money on time. They didn't get their miracle on time. They didn't get this. They didn't get that. Then they start to doubt the love of God. Then they start to doubt, well, God, is there <clears throat> maybe something wrong in my life? Or am I maybe not doing something right? Or, Lord, maybe I don't know enough. Maybe I haven't been to church enough. Maybe I haven't prayed enough. And then they start to doubt the love of God. Anytime you start to doubt God's love toward you, your faith will never work. Right. You can study everything there is about faith, about the gifts, and you can pray in tongues until you are raptured up in the glory. But once you start to doubt the love of God and the fidelity of God, then nothing else is going to work in the last. 
This is the message that they heard in the beginning. This is the message that turned the world upside down. Let me ask you something. Are we turning our world upside down? No. We're not even getting their pockets turned inside out. We're not even getting their hair messed up. Are we turning our world around? Are we altering it for Jesus? Are people that have now been filled with anger and animosity now beginning to look at each other and willing to accept something else other than you hurt me and I hurt you and I don't want to talk to you and you're bad and I'm good and this, that, and another and I can't see you anymore because you wounded me, 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 me and we're all the time tuning the strings of our own heart? No, we're not. We're not. Do you know why? We have got such a diversified message today. One little group's preaching one thing, another little group's preaching another thing, another little group's preaching another thing, and they keep within their little groups. And their little group gets more glorified, more glorified, more glorified, and eventually it becomes petrified. It got so glorified. And it has not yet done anything. We have got a world, a world of people that will never come into your door. We've got a world of people with hurts and wants and cares and desires, just like you do, just like I do, just like anybody else does. And the fact of it is, is that with all the diversity that we've got today, with all the television, with all the radio, with all the cassettes, with all the printed literature, with all of that, we are still not touching our generation. If anything, and I want you to be honest with this and think about it, if anything, we're still dividing them. We're dividing them into little groups. Paul came into town. Paul was upset in Corinth. He came into town and the church in the area of Corinth was already fragmented. He said, this one group says you're a Paul, and another group says you're a Peter, and another group says they're of Apollos, and another group says they're of Jesus. He said, is Christ divided? There is one primary message. One primary message. And if we will simply get back to some simplistic things, we can turn our world upside down like Jesus did in his day and the disciples did in their day. Let's look further. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. I don't want to love them. I want to pray for them. Your prayers are about as good as chapstick on a windy day. They can only lightly cover, but they will not heal if you can't love them. That's right. If you want to pray for somebody and you're not willing to get involved with them, then all you're doing is exercising some spiritual obligation and you have not done them any good whatsoever. If you cannot love them, then you cannot effectively pray for them. Everybody you find that Jesus ministered to in the Bible, he extended his love. He extended his care. The little leper that came down, eaten up with maybe nodular leprosy, and he was saying, Lord, if you only will, you can make me whole. Jesus loved him because he did not say, I love you, be blessed. He reached out and he touched the man. You cannot love someone without touching them. It's like a husband telling his wife all the time, Honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. And she's doubting his love. But he tells her all the time, Honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. You and me, babe. Honey, I love you. And every now and then you walk up, punch her on the shoulder. Babe, you know I love you, babe. You know I love you, babe, babe, babe. Honey, I love you. Honey, I love you. And is it any wonder down the line she starts to doubt his love, fear of his love, fear that she's not loved, fear that her life is going nowhere? But she hears the love word all the time. You might as well be saying, Honey, I chilly you. Peanut butter, babes. <laughs> Avocados. It's just a word. That's right. Without a fabric behind it, it's just a word. Right. Anyone that Jesus ministered to, he extended love to. For you see, if you want ministry and you can't extend love to the people that you minister to, all you're doing is exercising your prerogative to move in gifts. But the only thing about it is the Holy Spirit won't meet it you're going through an exercise that will produce nothing. We start to love one another. When we love one another, we start to look at each other with new eyes. Not with these little squeaky eyes where we look out our corner of our eyes and say, I wonder what the real motive is. You know, it's time that we started putting down what everybody's motives are because bottom line, everybody's got a motive. I've got no motive. Oh, grow up. Everybody's got a motive. Either outwardly or inwardly, there is something that we are either looking for, aspiring for, or wanting for in everything that we do. You don't do anything without a motive because a motive means a purpose. And you say, I did something I had absolutely no purpose in it. I guarantee you, you didn't do anything if you didn't have a purpose. You have a motive for getting up, don't you? You don't want to sit down anymore. You have a motive for going to bed. 
you go to sleep because you don't want to stay awake anymore. Everything you do has a motive behind it. So we tend to think, I'm just, I'm just serving God without any motive. You're not serving God then. There must be a purpose, and the purpose must be to touch someone else's life while you're still yet alive. Amen. Looking further. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and slew his brethren. Wherefore he slew him, because Cain's own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. Do you realize that you are running against a double-edged sword? You have been told that you are not of this world any longer, but you are in this world. You have been born from above and placed here. You are not a part of it. You are not to conform to the image of this world. You are not of this world, but you are in this world. And the fact of it is that the world hates you. The world hates you because of who lives in you. And because of who lives in you, you have got to reach to those that have hated you. And that's where it becomes difficult. You've got to swallow your pride. You've got to swallow the ideas. You've got to swallow, well, can't we just build our group bigger? Do you realize if you minister to people and they never get into your group, God still accepts that? That's right. We sometimes think if we don't get them into our group, you know, it's not God. Not all of them are going to come to your That's group. Right. Looking further. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from life unto death. A lot of people say, I know I'm saved because I got the Holy Spirit in me. Seen him lately? What does he look like? Well, he looked real good in the morning. When I look in the mirror, I got a big smile and, and the light's kind of coming out of my face. Maybe your socks are too tight. You've got a lot of blood up into your face. That's no real evidence that the Holy Spirit lives in you. I got happy feet. Mm -mm 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 -mm. That just means maybe you got happy feet. Doesn't mean that you got the Holy Spirit in you. I know I'm saved because I cleaned up real good. Praise God that we can clean up real good. A lot of people clean up and really look nice. But that doesn't mean that you got Jesus Christ living in you. I went down to the front. I was so embarrassed. I went down to the front and I got my name on a list. I got dunked in the water. Hallelujah, I'm going to heaven. I got the witness bearing in my heart. How do you know you got the witness bearing in my heart? Because my preacher said, can I be honest with you? You're going to believe everything a preacher says. <laughs> then you started to get smart. Because there's still people. Believe what they can back up by the word. Not their suppositions. And I'm a preacher and I'll tell you that. How do you know you've got him? How do you know you're saved? The Bible, look at that scripture verse we were just looking at. We know that we have passed from death unto life. That's what salvation is. You were dead, now you're alive. You had to pass through it. You passed from death unto life. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. The evidence that you've really got Jesus Christ in your heart. You're not an old crab. And you're not some old prune back there sitting in the back saying, well, praise God, if those people just don't get it right, they deserve to go to hell. Nobody deserves hell. That's right. Nobody deserves hell. <coughs> My ministry is not to be in contact with people. Why? Are you infectious? Come on. My ministry is just to be locked away solely to pray. No, it's not. No, it's not. If your prayers do not have feet on it, if your love does not have a hand to it, then your prayers have simply become a hermit's way of escaping the pressures of the time. And our prayer life simply becomes an outlet for our pent-up frustrations. No, God told me my whole life is nothing but a prayer life. You can't even find that in the Bible. Jesus never said that. That is new Pentecostal charismatic theology that keeps us from getting out and enjoying our life with somebody else. Well, I love all the people. Do you ever touch them? Are you ever around them? Do you ever reach out to them? Well, no, that's not my ministry. Then check what ministry is. The word ministry means rendering services. Well, I am rendering services. I'm praying for them all the time. Let me ask you something. If they are cold, are your prayers going to make them warm? If they're hungry, are your prayers going to feed them? Yes, I'm going to pray and God's going to use somebody else. Why can't God use you? Greatest joy in the world is being able to reach out and bless somebody. Not just sit back and pray. 
prayer is vital. Prayer is biblical. But we have developed a generation of almost anesthetic people. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to get in touch. We don't want to have to go where the bad is. We don't want to have to reach out and do anything. But we want to pray for them. We want to love them from a distance. We want to do this and we want to do that. But when it comes to getting in contact with them, we don't want to do that. Why? Because they're aggravating and they're dirty and they're frustrating and they don't talk like we talk and they don't act like we act and they're not perfect. Well, neither were we, were we? The real factor of love is that you just don't talk about it. The real factor of love is that you get involved with something. Do you know that the people in our generation have come to the point to where they can come to the altars and pray and cry, sling clinics with the best of... I wish I had a concession in the clinics companies. I mean, just a little bit of the stock. You're talking about money. We can cry in the altars with the best of them. We can shout. We can do so many, many, many things and talk about how much we love God. Do you realize the Bible says that if you really love God, according to John 14, 21 through 23, if you really love God, it's not the emotional outburst of the tears that roll down our face that ruin our clothes. That if you really love God, you know His Word, you know His Word, and you do His Word. Failure not to do the Word means that we truly don't love God, but we love a concept, a nice religious concept that keeps us safe from all the problems that we confront with people. You know, anytime you get involved with people, you got a problem. you got a problem. I remember years ago, my wife's uncle used to be a rodeo star. He rode bulls. He was good. He was tough, but he was an alcoholic. And he wanted to fight everybody and their brother when he got drunk. I remember them calling. I'd led him to the Lord, witnessed to him so many times. I remember them calling. He was down in an area in Biloxi in a bar. The bar was notorious. It was notorious for cuttings, gougings, people never being seen again. It was a bad place. You may know of something like that in this area. Every area has got at least one or two. Well, he called at the bar and he said, a bunch of guys are going to beat me up and I want to get my life right. Would you please come get me? <laughs> Do I really want to get involved with this man? Do I really want to reach out and help him in his life? Do I really now, because I know he's using Jesus as a tool to get to me. I know he's using something as a, as a hook. And people use that all the time. That's okay. As long as you know that they're doing it. All right. So I said, yes, praise God, I'm coming. So I went down. I went through the front doors. It was hairy. There were people with scars. I mean, we're talking about ugly people. We're talking about people that would bite you in a minute. Crawl across the floor and bite you on the ankle and never let you, never let you know it. They were bad. And he was coward back in the back with the phone. Holding the phone in his hand. Off the hook. Swing it at people. And I'm thinking, this is great. This is great. Local minister gets in large fight in local bar, bringing out a man that is screaming that... I prayed, Lord, what do you want me to do? Shall I wade through them? Or, you know, you can leap over a troop and run through a wall if you want to, or run through a troop and leap over a wall. Which one do you want this one on, Lord? Which way are we going to go on this? So I decided, well, praise God, let's just go get him. And I walked over to where he was, walked right through the crowd, walked over to where he was, took him by the shirt, started out, and he was saying, oh, pray for me. Oh, pray for me. Oh, pray for me. I said, you mean right now? Let's wait till we get to the car. No, let's do it right now. You want me to come down here? I'm down here. Let's pray right now. He, he's people not going to accept that. He's people not going to accept that. No, let's pray, praise God, right now. So we stood right into the bar and we started praying. I started praying for him and I started praying for these people that looked like they would bite you. And I started praying for them. And before long, the music got quiet. And then before long, I looked around. I see ministers can peek. We tell everybody else to bow your heads and be quiet. That's one of the virtues of being a minister. You get to peek. Everybody else's head down and you get to do this to see really what they're doing, you know. And if their heads are down, you say, your head wasn't down. It's like at the dinner table. Everybody bow their head to pray. And after they've got up, one of your children says, looks at another child and says, your head wasn't down. How do they know their head wasn't down, okay? And so we started to pray and pretty soon peeking, 
the virtue that we have as ministries, I started looking around, and these bad people-biting people started bowing their heads praying. And they started getting quiet. And they weren't biting or screaming or scratching anymore. And then the man that I went in there to get out got mad. He got mad because all of these drunks were getting quiet. And he got mad. He wanted them beat up or whatever. I don't know what he wanted. But he was trying to use Jesus Christ as a, as a tool, a leverage to get something. And there are many people, when you get involved with people, there are many people, they've got a motive. And they will use Jesus as a leverage to try to get you to do something. But guess what? They still need help. And they need somebody to reach to them that's not going to get mad at them and beat them up and throw them out and say, you're not going to use my Jesus like that. Do you really realize or you really think Excuse me, that Jesus didn't know that he wasn't being used so many times. Certainly he was. But he did what in the process? He was used. We as Christians begin to feel taken advantage of. Be glad you've got something to be taken advantage of. They're just using me. Be glad they got something that they can use. Well, they're, they're taking advantage of me. That's because we get me back on the throne. My ministry, my life, me, what I want. It's an inconvenience, an inconvenience. Ministry is about people. Now, not all people are going to be like little docile sheep that come along that you pray for them, and they go, hallelujah, hallelujah, and everything is great. You're going to have many people that you go through same problems over and over and over with again. And you say, they've got devils, bats in their belfry. They've got terrible demons. They've got this. They've got that. They've got one thing down underneath, whether it's devils, bats, or brain damage. They've got one thing. They have got a right to live, and they are a person. And Jesus Christ died for them as much as he died for you or me. And they deserve someone reaching them. He said, but I, I've tried to reach them and I, and I can't. You give them all that you can and then God will send somebody else along that will finish up the job. <laughs> Going further. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hate you. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brethren abideth in death. That word death is the word separation from God. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding or living in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he, God, through Jesus, laid down his life for us, that we ought to lay down our life for the brethren. Whoso has this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shut up his bowel of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth. The world today is crying out for the deed. The deed. We need to see it. We need to reach. We need to do. Almost every one of you in here in one facet or another has failed in one thing. You maybe have aspired to do something for God. You wanted to do something for God. You wanted to make some great event for God. Or you wanted to be used. And in one way or the other, you failed. How many besides me have ever been there? You wanted to do something for God. And you really stepped out with a real heart to do it and fell flat on your face. Yep. Anybody beside me ever done it twice? <laughs> do I hear a number three? How about a number four? Have we ever clutched it up? But guess what? We're still here and still moving. But after about number two and number three, you get shell-shocked. And you start to say, God, I want to do something, but I'm getting a little banged here. God, I, I want to reach out, but I'm, I'm a little afraid to take a chance again, to reach out again, to take a chance again, to take a chance again. Life is about chances. Trees don't take a whole lot of chances, do they? But then again, they don't do a whole lot. They just kind of leaf around, isn't that right? <laughs> Rocks are very solid and steadfast, but they don't go very far, do they? They don't take many chances. They don't have the ability that you do. The world is wrought with opportunity. The world is wrought with opportunity to make someone else's life great. And when you make someone else's life great, your life becomes great. When you bring someone else out of depression and the pit, when you bring someone else's life out of failure, all you're doing is bringing your life out. We have majored so long in our movement that we're trying so hard to get our own spirituality up. We want to become really spiritual to let God see how much we are and how much we love Him. And we have tried for our own spirituality. We've prayed. We've done all of these things. We've fasted all for our own spirituality. Do you realize that you will never be any more truly spiritual than when you're reaching out to touch the life of somebody else? 
And do you realize that you will never be any closer to God? Never any closer to God as when you reach out and touch the life of someone else who's got nothing else to live for? That's when you're the absolute closest to Jesus Christ. Nah, -uh, I was the closest to God in praise service. Who have you touched? What has it affected? I ministered to God. Can I be blunt? Does he need our ministry? I mean, has he got a problem? We need it. But how best do we minister to God? Jesus said, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. You want to minister to God? You really want to truly minister to God? Reach out and minister to somebody else. Believe in somebody. Touch somebody. Say, yeah, but when you believe in them, they're going to let you down. Well, praise God. Go anyway. Amen. Believe in them. Touch in them. Give them a reason to get up. Give them a reason to exist. Don't worry about how close you can get to God in your prayer life, in your prayer closet, in your fasting, in your shouting, in everything else. You want to be close to God? Then touch somebody else that's crying, that's dying, that's afraid, that's got absolutely no reason to get up and go again. The reason that we have failed so many times in ministry is because we have wanted ministry for ourselves. Right. We say, well, I wanted to touch other people. Yeah, but what was it going to do for you in the process? Right. What were you going to get out of it? Notoriety, position, power. What were you going to get out of it? Money, fame, what? And we have wanted with our hearts, say, God, but I really want this to work for you. But what was our hearts majoring on? It was majoring on us. What we were going to do, our ministry, how we were going to reach. I know that. I've been there with all the right intentions of wanting to do this and wanting to do that so that we could reach out only to find out that in the end, the reason that it failed is because we couldn't get our eyes off of us. Somebody's going to take advantage of us. It's not going to work. God, I'm afraid. If you want your life to work, praise God, it's time to get up and reach again. If you want to truly be close to Jesus, praise, worship, sing, dance, do everything that brings rejoicing to your heart, but realize that's not going to get you the closest to God. Right. The closest to God is when you reach out and you touch a life of somebody else that's got nothing else to live for, and then you become a living line between them and God. Hallelujah. That is the absolute closest. Hallelujah. Learn to trust people again. Uh, I'm afraid of people. Why? Not everybody bites. I'm afraid they've got an ulterior motive. Everybody has an ulterior motive, but not all of them are bad. Put down the walls. Why was the first century church so effective? They had relationships. They got involved. They hid their own inadequacy so, so they could reach out and touch somebody else. That's what life now is all about. We've got a generation that is not being touched. We've got television. We've got radio. We've got everything that should touch people but it's not being done. The only way that it's going to be done is when we as an individual start reaching out and making somebody else's life count. And don't give them a lot of words. Don't just give them a track. And if all of life is and all the church is is getting revved up on Sunday, you might as well have gone to a circus. Amen. At least you could have eaten popcorn. There's got to be more to church and ministry than just coming together. It's got to be more than just, well, let's pray. It's got to be more than us. Let's just get our life right with God. How many times do you have to get it right? The closest and the strongest you will ever be is when you're reaching out. And until we reach out, we're still like novices. We can know all the books. We can know all the phrases. We can know all the prayers. We can know all about the gifts. But until we learn to reach out and get involved with people, we're novices. I want to quickly cover a factor. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, God created you for good works. Created for you for good works. The Bible says in Philippians 2.13 that God is now working in you and willing in you. Willing for what? Good works. Working in you for what? Good works. Working in you to reach out just like he did. You want to know what good works look like in the Bible? Good works look like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's what good works look like. Good works do not look like big programs, ongoing programs. Work looks like touching people. You want to work the works of God? You want God working in you? Then you must be interacting with people. Christianity cannot be divorced from hurting, crying, dying people. 
Christianity has been injected back into the life for the life of Jesus Christ dwelling in you has been put back into the life to interact with the lost and the dying people of the world. Not to draw away and become little religious communities, but to reach in and touch lives. You have been created for good works. It's amazing how we can get revved up if we're going to have a banana pudding supper. We can get revved up if we're going to have a sing-in. But anytime somebody starts to say you need to reach out and touch people, it's amazing how quickly their spirit level goes down. Because you see, it's easy to shout and giggle and wiggle. But it's difficult to get out and touch and live it. It's easy to hide behind a door and pray about it. It's difficult come Monday to get up and do something about it. It's easy to say, oh God, touch my brother such and such across the town. Uh, Holy Spirit, go over there. He doesn't go over there. He sends you. He sends you. You don't send the Holy Spirit. He sends you. Well, I'll send an angel. He's not going to go either. They don't minister that way. They don't understand the gospel, the grace of God, like you do. Therefore, he can't minister what they need. Four quick things that absolutely block us from our victory. Number one, we're afraid to take risks. When we're afraid to take risks, then we don't do anything. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 1, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You're already righteous. It's time to become bold again. Not tell everybody how bad they are and how bad their life is. They already know that. Not tell them what a wretched sinner they are. For the most part, they already know that. They want to know that somebody cares enough to get involved with them right where they are, right how they are. Don't be afraid to take risks again. If you've ever failed in any endeavor for God, get back up and reach again. If you've ever been in a church and wounded, get up again. If somebody's ever taken advantage of you, take a risk again. You say, but what if it happens again? What if it does? You didn't die the last time, did you? I felt like I died. That's because you lend on your feelings more than you do on the fact of forgiving and forgetting and getting up and going. You say, well, that's easy for you to say. It is now easy for me to say, for I have found the easy way to do it. Forgive them, forget it, and look at them with new eyes and just get up and keep going. Don't be afraid to take risks. Well, will I get hurt again? Probably. Will it be as bad as the last time? Probably not. What if it is? You'll get over it. Well, I didn't think God wanted me to go through anything like that. He went through it. You'll go through it. We're not above the master, are we? Was he betrayed? You'll be betrayed. Did he get frustrated? Yeah, he got frustrated. He got frustrated with the disciples. He said, how long have I got to put up with you guys? And then he put up with them a while longer, didn't he? Don't be afraid to take risks. What would you aspire to do? What would you like to do? What would you want to do? Do you want to break the ice, meet somebody? Do you want to break the ice and bless somebody? Do you want to break the wall down and reach out and touch somebody? Restore a relationship? Restore a friendship? What do you want to do? Everything that you do is a risk. You get in your car, it's a risk. You come to church, it's a risk. You pray, it's a risk. You know why? You might actually hear from God and He might actually tell you to do something and that's a risk. God, I've been doing all this praying. I really didn't expect you to talk back to me. And and if I did, Lord, I I really didn't expect you to tell me to go do something. I better go get a couple confirmations to make sure this really is God. (laughs) Don't be afraid to take risks. Philippians 1.28 says, In nothing terrified by your adversary. In nothing terrified by your adversary. The second thing is don't think too much. We have become an analytical generation. We think so much. Well, I would like to do that, but now let me think. Now, what would happen if this happened, if I did that, and that happened if I did this? Well, now, you know, if I did this and this happened, and this happened because I did this, then, you know, this might actually happen. None of it has happened yet. And we think too much. We think it won't work. We won't be accepted. This won't happen. That won't happen. And we think so much that we talk ourselves out of it. Anybody besides me ever done that? Want to do something and just thought so much about it, you talked yourself out of it? Do you realize that when God speaks to you, it's usually on the first spontaneous impulse? And then we start to say, well, I better think about that. Was that really God or not? And then the second voice you start to hear is definitely the enemy coming to take the word out that was first given you. 
And so we start to listen to the second voice. And the second voice is not telling us what the second, first voice did. So he said, I'm not even going to accept that. I, I'm, going to, I'm going to just think about this. Then the third voice is going to be you. First voice will be God. Second voice will always be the enemy to come to take the word. The third voice is going to be us. You listen to two and three and you're going to mess up. Well, you know, we, we, we got to be careful. Take a risk. That's right. What if I miss God? You can catch up. We're so afraid that we won't catch up. You mean he doesn't love us enough to come back around and grab us? Oh, God's moving too fast in this generation. He's not moving that fast. He's not moving so fast he's going to leave you behind. Don't think yourself out of it. The third thing is self-doubt. Lord, I, I really don't think I'm worthy for this. Why not? You know, I learned a little secret a while back. If you don't think that you're worthy enough to receive the blessing, you will never get it. If you ever prayed and asked God for healing or for anything and then felt, but God, you know, I know I really don't deserve this. Who told you you don't deserve that? But God, you got to be humble. That's not being humble. That's being ridiculous. God, we don't deserve this. Then why did he die for you to have it if he didn't think you deserved it? You don't deserve it on your own merit, your own ability, because of what you've done. You deserve it because of what he did. And if he died for you to have it, yes, praise God, you deserve everything that that Bible said. You deserve to have your life happy, right, ongoing, victorious. You deserve for life to be real. You deserve to be joyful. You deserve to have friends. You deserve to be loved. You deserve for a second chance, third chance, fourth chance, tenth chance, a Google of chances. You deserve that. And if you do not believe, you do not, if you do not believe you deserve it, you can't put faith out for it. That's right. And you can't believe for it. For see, with one part of our mouth or our mind, we believe, I believe I'm going to get it, I believe I'm going to get it. But on the other side, we are unstable. We're saying, oh, but God, oh, God, oh, God, I'm so unworthy. Well, quit acting unworthy. Good being unworthy. I'll always be unworthy. No, you won't. If Jesus died for you, He has made you righteous. He has made you holy. He has made you complete. You are complete in Him. If you do not believe you deserve what the Word said, you will never get it. See, there's two parts to receiving. God sends it, but we've got to accept it. If you don't believe you deserve it, no matter how much you're saying, gimme, 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 you can never accept it. Don't doubt what you can do and what you can be. And then the last thing is quit hesitating. Don't hesitate. Procrastination in the things of God is nothing but fear. Fear that you're going to fail. Fear that you're going to look bad. Fear that it's not going to work. Fear that somebody else is going to think something wrong. You may have been hurt. Well, praise God, you can get over it. I remember preaching one time. A lot of people in there with problems. They had been bickering and backbiting. And I just stopped and said, you got problems? Deal with them. That's right. Later, my wife says, oh, Mr. Compassion. <laughs> but the fact of it was that they had been prayed for so many times. I mean, little angels should be around every one of them's head. They had been anointed with oil so many times, they could have fell down and slid across the floor. They had been had hands laid on them so many times, they should have been bruised. And nothing had happened. You know why? They were only praying and anointing and doing all of these things. Not a one of them was dealing with anything. They were waiting for God to deal with it. God does this part and we do our part. I thought God was going to do it all. If you don't accept it, it won't come. Don't hesitate. Is there something that you want to do? Someone you want to reach? Someone that you want to see their life change? You want to get back in the saddle and quit being hurt? You feel like you've been hurt and frustrated? You feel like everywhere you've gone, you've been taken advantage of? You feel like, Lord, there, there's no place to go? God, I don't fit in. Oh, yes, you do fit in. Don't hesitate. Start making decisions. Amen. Well, I'm going to go pray about it. Isn't it an amazing thing that we can get so involved in going and praying about something that we never get around to doing it? But we're praying about it. I'm praying about going to the mission field. Then why don't you go? Why don't you really say, why don't you want to go? It's hot and it's sweaty and it's a long way off and I would miss lunch. <laughs> God, I'm praying about forgiving that person. Why don't you ask them to forgive you? Why don't you forgive them? Why just pray about it? Well, I'm getting up my courage is what I'm really doing. How long does it take to get our courage up? You know the best way to get your courage up? Tighten your stomach and step up. 
Just step up. What does tighten your stomach got to do with it? I know it's just doing something, so you'll do something. <laughs> Swallow your pride and do something. But what if they don't accept me? The big thing is what if they do accept you? Now, how are you going to handle a new relationship? But I've been hurt. Everybody will be hurt. And you can get over it and can live through it. What are you going to do with your life? God has not called us just to temple worship all the time. God has not just called us to do all the high priestly things all the time. He's called us to believe and to love and to reach and to do. get involved again. Don't doubt what God can do and wants to do through you. And don't hesitate about it. And quit getting everybody else's opinion. Most people are the slave of the last opinion that they heard. They listen to what the last person said, the last opinion, and they simply become a slave of the last opinion that they heard. Well, were they with you when you didn't feel good? Did they feed you? Did they hug your kids? Did they tuck you in? If they hadn't done any of those things, why listen to their opinion? Especially if they just want to give you a religious opinion. And if they don't love you, why listen to their opinion? If they don't add to you, why listen to their opinion? All they're doing is exercising their religious prerogative to be religious. If someone doesn't love you and isn't willing to get involved with you, then why in the world let them pray for you? The simple reason, the prayer's not going to work. There is no sincerity in it. Isn't it time that we as the body of Christ started really stirring ourselves? Let go. You've been hurt? Let go. Let it go. Take a chance again. Amen. Take a chance. Learn. Learn, 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 learn. But just don't become a religious egghead. Learn and then apply. Learn and apply. Learn and apply. Learn and apply. The best way to truly learn is learn it and then get up and do it. Right. And then as you're doing it, you find out, well, it didn't really work the way I thought it would. So go back and look at it again and go back and do it again. The best way to make life count is to live it. Don't isolate yourself and lick wounds. Don't isolate yourself with all the one day, man, I really could have done this. And this could have been done and that could have been done. Oh, if I would have only done this. Do it. Do it. Break the ice. Talk, love, bless, reach, touch, do, be. But above all, live. Jesus died for us to live. And it's so very sad that so many people in churches today don't live. They just exist. They exist from one service to another. From one service to another. Start reaching out. Your life counts much more than you realize. Do you realize there are people that you can touch I could never touch? People you could reach that I could never reach? I may have had a lot of background and training, but that doesn't matter. You can touch people that I can never touch. There can be lives that you can turn around for good. And you know what God's really looking for after all is said and done? He's not looking for how many times you showed up, how often you prayed, how many gold stars you've got in your annals of eternity for showing up on time and bringing your Bible and bringing your tithes. All of those are wonderful things, but that's not what he's looking for. What he's really looking for is the lives that you have touched by your life. When you get to heaven... Are you going to be able to look around and see people that you have influenced to be there? Or are you just going to say, yes, I made it, hallelujah. I'm glad you made it, yes. I'm glad you're there. But who are you going to see? Who would you see that you drew, that you touched? Have you ever heard of a man named Booth, William Booth, the original founder of the Salvation Army? He had a dream and it turned his life around. In this dream, he was so busy doing the work. In this dream, he dreamed that he went to heaven. And there when he went to heaven, a lady that he had known back on earth came to him. And she says, oh, General Booth, did you get to minister to my son? He just lived right down the block from you. And he said, mm. you know, we were really busy working, getting all of this organized. And I, I never really got around to talking to him. And the woman walked away. And he stood there for a moment. And then he looked and another man came up. And he said, Dr. Booth, or General Booth, did you get to minister to my wife? You passed going to your place. You pass where we live every day. And oh, we saw you. And oh, you were such a man of God. Oh, you were such a man of God. And my wife and I knew you were such a man of God. Did you get to talk to her? She was really having trouble after I died. Did, did you get to go talk to her? And he thought, no, 
I never did. Before long, a, a young person came up in his dream. He said, oh, Dr. Booth, General Booth, did you talk to my mom and daddy? They fought all the time, and they drank all the time, and they didn't mean to do what they did to me. And oh, oh, did you talk to them? And he said, no, I didn't. And then he said, God, don't let me stay here. I don't deserve to be here. I don't deserve to be here. I was so busy, God, being religious and doing all the religious things, organizing that the very ones around me that I should have touched, I never touched. He said, oh, God, I don't deserve to be here. He said, a wonderful presence came. A wonderful presence came. Everyone else was joyful. He said he felt such shame. He bowed his head and said, oh God, I don't deserve to be here. He woke up in his bed. And he said, God, thank you. God, thank you that you allowed me to come back. Even if it was just a dream, God, thank you that you allowed me to come back. And he immediately went to all of those people. When you get to heaven, who are you going to see? What are you going to influence? Are you just going to show up and say, Yo, God, I'm here. What a deal. Whoopee. What have you done with those that you pass up? Of Jesus. Well, give them a real reason to believe that. Don't hesitate any longer. You don't have that much time. Well, I'll pray about it. Then I know what you'll do. Nothing. But those that say, praise God, I'll make a difference for those that take a chance, those that reach, those that are scarred, those that are bruised. But in the end, the real evidence that it works isn't that you've got a great house and glory. The real evidence that it works is that you've got the scars to prove you tried. Oh, but I want those crowns when I get to heaven. You know what you can do with the crowns anyway when you get to heaven? You're going to throw them at his feet. So who cares about all the great gold crowns anyway? It's the scars that prove that it works. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you today. Dear God, that your word is true and your word is alive and real. Father, let us again learn to reach and to love. And Father, quit going through our pity parties and our situations that we go over and over and over again. Father, let us be bold and daring and reach and touch and bless and Father, not be afraid of everybody else's opinions anymore. Dear God, let us look truly upon the fields white under harvest. So many of them are about to mildew because they've never been touched. Father, let us no longer sit back with the excuses, well, I don't know enough and I can't study it. I don't know this and I don't know that. Father, stir our hearts to take the initiative to do more, to be more, to reach more, to touch more. With your heads bowed and your eyes gone, with your eyes closed, if there are those that have taken advantage of you, release it right now. Release it right now. You can't carry that luxury of carrying that around. If there are those that have not shown you the kind of love that you have wanted, release them right now. If there are those that you have wanted to touch but you've just simply been afraid to touch, because you thought they had some ulterior motive, then praise God, purpose that you're a direct representation of Jesus Christ. And if there is an ulterior motive, it's just going to have to be toward Him. Your head's bowed and your eyes closed. You're only here for a while. What are you doing with you? 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 Father, I ask you today, Dear God, to stir the hearts of these people. They're a good people. Father, they love you. They're learning. They have a wonderful body of church, a wonderful ministry. Father, stir their hearts again. Father, they feed the hungry. Lord, they reach out to the needy. But Father, even beyond that, it must be, dear God, even in their days where there have been walls and you have been afraid of people, let it down. Father, stir their hearts and cause them to reach up and be more than they have ever been. Let them truly in our generation that is void of true heroes, dear God, let them become the heroes, the heroes that are worthy to be written in the book. Dear God, stir their lives again, no longer to hesitate or to talk themselves out of it, 
or to doubt that they deserve it or to just be afraid to try. Stir their hearts again, Father. And Father, in the process, I thank you as you do this. You will let them see and redeem their days, count their time. I know if anything is ever going to be done, it must start now. And for this, Father, I praise you. And I thank you and I worship you, Father, that we're not afraid. We're not failures. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want you to look at me. Before I turn it to Brother Marcy, I want you to look at me. Does someone need to lay hands on you and pray for you to get that? No. Can someone impart that into you? No. Can we get all the elders around you and lay hands on you and impart that into you? No, it's not even in the Bible. That is in Chrismania. It is not in the Bible. No one can impart that into you. It is in you, and it must come out. Can we just get you up to the front and pray that you'll make that kind of commitment? You can just as easily pray that you make that kind of commitment there. But if I stand up in front of people, won't that make me that much more committed? No. How many times have we done that before and it still hasn't produced anything? It's a resolve in our heart, a fact in our heart that we make the decision, God, if I've got at least one more day to live, I'm going to live it and I'm going to make someone else's life count. If you will do that, then you will truly fulfill what the message is. If we don't, we simply go through the motions over and over again, simply being religious and trying to find a way to make us closer to God, when in truth, you will never be closer to Him than you in reaching out and touching somebody else. Do you know why? Because He's going to have to touch them through you. How close is He going to have to be to touch them through you? He's going to have to be closer to you than you are to yourself. Now, that's what ministry is about. It's not deep, it's not hard, and it's not shouting, but it's tough. Can you handle it? Amen? Amen. Love you. Lord bless you.